Tonight on Primetime Politics, the Trudeau retreat. After the Prime Minister bends to opposition pressure, what does it say about the NDP deal that keeps the Liberals in power? Coming up, we'll speak to our political strategists and dig deeper into the decision and the need to have the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff testify before committee. Also, we were pleased to have the full mandate come out and the work started by uh, the former Governor General now. David Johnston has his mandate letter, but a former Chief Electoral Officer for Canada is making his opinion known. He says there needs to be a public inquiry. We will hear from Jean-Pierre Kingsley. And is the foreign interference issue and how the government is dealing with it affecting voter intentions? We'll speak to polls analyst Eric Grenier. This is Primetime Politics. Hello everyone, I'm Michael Sarabio. Well, the decision to fight and then allow Katie Telford to appear before the procedure committee really tested the Liberal NDP confidence agreement. The Prime Minister only allowing his Chief of Staff to testify after Conservatives introduced a motion in the House and only after the NDP threatened to vote against the Liberals on the one issue. Now asked today whether it was a mistake to fight the opposition on the matter weeks ago only to acquiesce this week, here is what we heard from the Prime Minister earlier. I think it's really important that Parliament works uh, and that is something that has been uh, at the forefront of what we're doing so that serious issues can be dealt responsibly in Parliament and uh, that's uh, why we've been uh, pushing hard on the Special Rapporteur. We were pleased to have the full mandate come out and the work started by uh, the former Governor General now uh, and uh, we're happy to work with the NDP and other parliamentarians uh, to make sure that Parliament uh, doesn't end up as toxic as it has been in the past. Oh, well, let's talk more about the decision to let Katie Telford testify and bring in our political strategist. Susan Smith is the principal of the Blue Sky Strategy Group. Melanie Petady is the president of Texture Communications. And Kim Wright is principal of Wright Strategies. Hello to the three of you. Hello, Hello Michael. Hi. Now, Susan, the PMO uh, made their announcement about Telford uh, just minutes really before the procedure committee was set to meet yesterday. Did the Prime Minister blink here? Was he surprised that the New Democrats were not siding with the government on this one? I think it was more a reading of the tea leaves. And this is a story that wasn't going away. And the committee wrangling was wearing on. So I think that it was a, more of an acceptance that this was the right thing that needed to happen. And it was time. There may have been a bit of time buying. I'm speculating while they ironed out the full mandate for the special rapporteur because they were able to announce that at the same time. But I think it was fairly inevitable that the prime minister's chief of staff would come before a committee. I think it was wise on the government to choose a committee that uh, is chaired by a government member versus an opposition member. I think it reduces the amount of shenanigans that'll go on. The one thing I would say is I actually on the whole think people are gonna be disappointed by um, any kind of questioning at these committees because this is national security. I mean, that's the one thing we have to remember. This is national security. So there is only going to be so much that individuals can say. And this is where I think that the, the role of the special rapporteur is much more important because he has a much more wide ranging uh, ability to dive into uh, some of these classified issues. Mm -hmm. And Melanie, but how about you? What do you think of uh, the prime minister finally relenting on Katie Telford? Well, I actually agree with much of what Susan just said. This move was purely strategic. They were clearly trying to avoid having to, to go to committee. They're hoping that the story would go away with time, but clearly it, it hasn't gone away and it's not going to go away anytime soon. Um, but, and that's why Liberal MPs were filibustering at PROC, at the, at the committee that now Katie Telford will be will be um, testifying at. And ultimately they had they had two choices. They could have Katie Telford testify at Ethics, which is chaired by Conservative MP John Broussard, or they could have her testify at PROC, which is the committee they've been asking for her in the first place, um, which is chaired by, by a Liberal, but it's also the committee where all of this like, weeks of filibustering that we've been seeing has been going on. So so I disagree with, with Susan. I think that there will still be plenty of shenanigans, unfortunately, in, in, at that committee. Um, but they certainly made their the best strategic pick. They also have a lot of experience, unfortunately, doing this now. Katie Telford has testified at uh, a committee twice already for we and for the investigation into General Vance. So this is sadly becoming a bit of a normal occurrence for this government.
Now, Kim, conservatives are at this point accusing the NDP of uh, participating in a liberal cover-up. Again, that's the conservative uh, accusation. The party could have voted with the conservative motion, transferred the whole affair to the Ethics Committee. If New Democrats wanted greater transparency, what's the reason for not joining the other opposition parties to support the conservative motion? Look, what Jagmeet Singh was very clear about, he said, we want Katie Telford to appear before committee. Uh, we got that. And had we not gotten that yesterday morning, we would have sided with the Conservatives. And that was exactly what Jagmeet Singh and the Democrats had said. We also want to see a public inquiry as to what happens, uh, what happened over the last couple of election campaigns. And let's be clear, it, this wasn't just happening at the federal level. We've seen evidence or at least speculation that at least in Ontario and potentially in some municipal elections, uh, there has been some push from some foreign entities. And we need to get to the bottom of this with elections officials, with our spy agency, and with the prime minister's office, because someone somewhere knew something about this. And if it was just some report that was sitting on a shelf collecting dust, I've got bigger questions to ask. But the reality is, over the last few weeks, the prime minister has done what they do in every situation, in we, in SNC-Lavalin. And they continue to kick the can down the road as far as they possibly can till it starts to stink so bad that Canadians are like, okay, but what are you actually hiding here? This seems sketchier than it should have been. And so now we have a fancy new cocktail party joke, a rapporteur. And the reality is we're going to end up getting to a public inquiry. We're not there yet. And really what came down to was they needed this off the front page because they have a budget next week and they've got the leader of the free world coming for dinner. And this is not the headlines they want when the leader of the free world shows up and you're under scrutiny as to whether foreign actors were interfering in your elections. Okay, well, I can't use the, the terminology kicking the can down the road. You're not the only one to do so. You know, Susan, if the PMO reacted to reports appropriately, at least in their opinion, why not just cut to the chase and have that inquiry instead of waiting for David Johnson to come up to that conclusion? I think the initial assessment is that it, it's a national security issue. And national security issues should not be aired on the front page of the national newspaper. They should not be aired um, with public answer. They should be aired, I think, or should be discussed with the right entities that need to discuss them. Um, I, I suspect that the Prime Minister's office and others felt that the appropriate actions had been taken. Uh, and I do know that the, the other, the Parliamentary Security Committee reviewed these things in the past. This is not new. Aaron O'Toole had information about this too, as well. Um, but I think the noise got really loud, unfortunately. Um, but, but I do Susan, think. The Prime Minister did yeah, suggest on, Kim, that he I didn't know anything David about Johnson this. And that becomes that scurrilous allegations nonsense. This is their usual MO, scurrilous allegations. No, I didn't know anything about it. Not. Maybe I knew something, maybe I didn't. We need it's, to get to the bottom of this. This isn't some charitable thing. This isn't uh, a question about you know who might have known someone. This is about the integrity of our elections. And if we can't get right. that straight, and I know Susan's talking point is going to be, oh, but official secrets act and all the rest of it. There are yeah, things but I don't that are have a talking point on this. There, game, are, there are things that are confidential. Kim, I don't have a talking point on this. I'm looking at this as a regular Canadian, and I'm looking for. I'm looking at I'm this looking as a, Kim, for I'm actual as a regular answers. Canadian. I don't think there's any threat to our democracy. I don't think our elections have been called into question, and I think that's probably the judgment call that was made at the time. But I think wow. there's a couple of things that worry me that people at CSIS are leaking things. First of all, that's a, that's an issue. I don't want our national security secrets discussed on the front page of the newspaper. I don't think that's smart. And from a government perspective, something the opposition would never understand is that there are always more things at play. There are in the, not from a democracy perspective, but from a trade perspective, from another perspective. I don't think there's anybody in this country. And I, I really do challenge the people on this panel. Do you think? there was an actual problem in the outcome of our election no and the government would have been different. There is there. I don't think that that's the case. And I don't think there are Canadians that believe that. But, but I think but, there are but, foreign but, state know, but, actors but that are potentially but, participating. But, but, but Susan, but Susan, maybe, not, Susan, maybe not the whole outcome, but even if it had an effect on one riding, does that not merit closer scrutiny? Well, we well, don't we know, know if it had an effect, effect on, on that riding. And I'm not sure those CSIS reports actually concluded that. David Johnston will have... A look at that. I do agree that the government took longer than it should have to nip this in the bud in terms of a course of action. I think they underestimated where this is going to go. And, and, and you know, Polyev went nuts from a partisan perspective for this. If this is about 
democratic our, our elections this should not be a partisan issue if this is about foreign state actors attempting to interfere in canadian democracy not fully succeeding not succeeding i think we should be looking at that but again that's not the front page of the paper that's a bigger play if you tell the bad guys all your moves they just come up with other moves so this is something i think people need to be a little bit grown up about looking at what is it we have a right to know what is it we we do have to trust that our national agencies are looking at and acting on and i think i look forward to what um uh former governor general david johnston an eminent Canadian says. And if we have to have a public inquiry, let's have a public inquiry. But I don't expect there to be great big Oprah style interviews with kimonos wide open about what's going on. That actually, from a national security uh, perspective for Canada, would just be stupid. Yeah, Melanie, I know you want to get in here. Yeah. <laughs> so I think two things can be true at the same time. I think that David Johnston is a very honorable man who is unlikely to squander his equity. I think it's also true that the prime minister is kicking the can down the road, just like Kim has said, just like Michael Cooper has said. Ultimately, I think David Johnson is going to find that there should be a public inquiry, which is what so many people have been calling for. And we will have wasted many months starting one. And I worry that while the outcome, the, the ultimate outcome of the 2019 and the 2021 elections were not jeopardized by foreign inter interference that a future one may be that if we don't, don't take action if we don't investigate this and actually get to the bottom of it and do the things that are necessary to continue to secure and be able to tell canadians yes our elections are safe at every level of government municipal provincial and federal if we don't take those actions right away i am worried about future elections so i think he's going to find that we need a public inquiry and we'll have wasted a whole bunch of time Okay. Well, but, with and that, Melanie, you make a good point that Canadians need to know that our elections are safe, but we're not going to know any more than that because they're not going to tell us what they're doing at great big levels of detail to do that. Okay. Uh, very quickly, I have less than a minute left. Kim, did you want to get in a word before we go? Look, uh, the Liberals would like to say that there are things that are confidential. We can't talk about them. And that's what they actually tried to do with, oh, you can come in and see the documents, but you can't tell anybody about it. This notion that there are secrets and there are politically expedient confidentiality rules is what is why every Canadian is going, this seems a little weird, this seems a little dicey. I want to see what safeguards are put in place in general speak in general terms but also how did we how did we make sure that our elections are safe because canadians deserve to know that answer and parliamentarians deserve to know that answer as well okay well we will continue to follow thank everything uh kim melanie susan thank you very much for the time this evening thank you thanks michael well after weeks focused on foreign interference with more to come are government and opposition actions affecting voter impressions? That is something that we wanted to discuss on the program tonight. And joining us right now is polls analyst Eric Grenier, the man behind the writ.ca. Eric, good to see you. Happy to be here. So how much traction is the story actually getting outside of Ottawa? Is it affecting uh, voter impressions and in intentions at this point? Well, I do think it is getting traction in the sense that people are aware of this story and they're following it. We did see some uh, polling by Leger that suggests that two-thirds of Canadians have at least heard of this story, but it doesn't seem to be having much of an impact on voting intentions. We still see the same kind of support for the Liberals, usually around 30-31% support, that we saw uh, before this story broke in mid-February, and for the Conservatives, we're not seeing a big lead for them. We're even seeing uh, some indications that their support has been dropping over the last little while. Uh, so it doesn't have a a, a big sign that this is really changing people's views of the parties. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it'll stay like that forever. Obviously, this story is going to continue for several weeks. But so far, we haven't seen much shift in the polls. Okay, so it will continue, as you say, for several weeks still. But you know, I, I do wonder about, you know, the boom and the echo effect here. Is it normal to have such a big story on the Hill not affecting voter intentions at this point? In a way, it is unusual, especially if we think about some of the past uh, controversies that have popped up over the last little while uh, for the Liberals. If you think about the SNC-Lamalay affair with uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould in early uh, 2019, that really tanked the Liberals, and they more or less haven't recovered from that since then. There was also the We Charity uh, controversy that when that erupted, the Liberals were doing quite well in the polls because of the pandemic, but when that story came out, their support dropped. We haven't seen the same kind of thing happen here. So it, it either suggests 
that uh, the liberal support is not going to go much further than this floor. And so a new story like this doesn't really change any minds. Or it could be that this isn't something that is changing people's minds, that they're not necessarily putting the blame on the liberals. And we'll have to wait and see if this will hold. But so far, it isn't having the same kind of impact that we saw in these other stories. Okay, so th so that has to do with the parties. I'm wondering about the leaders, though. Are we seeing anything uh, uh, in, in that area? And let's begin here with Justin Trudeau. Are the prime minister's numbers being affected by this? That, I think, is more of a concern for the Liberals. We've seen some polling by the Angus Reid Institute, for example, that uh, Justin Trudeau's approval rating has dropped quite a bit since the fall. In the polling that we've seen as well from Abacus data, the number of Canadians who say they have a positive impression of the Prime Minister is usually now about 30, 31 percent. And that seems to have been dropping by a little bit over the last few months. So it, it, we do get the impression that Justin Trudeau's own numbers uh, have been going down. There was a poll even by Nanos Research uh, that was published on Tuesday putting him behind Pierre Poilievre in terms of who Canadians preferred to be prime minister. Now, we haven't seen that in all polls. Some polls have sh show the opposite. But these weaker numbers for Justin Trudeau going forward could have a longer term impact on the Liberals. Often these uh, personal numbers are a leading indicator of where voting intentions will eventually go. Okay, I, I want to pick up on, on what you said about Pierre Poilievre, though, because if, if Justin Trudeau's numbers are being affected, his numbers are not going up? It doesn't seem like they're going up, at least not as much as you would think, uh, considering the issues that have been happening in Ottawa over the last uh, month or two. Uh, it, Pierre Poilievre's numbers are still not very good. His own personal approval ratings are usually quite low in uh, polling, and his disapproval ratings, or the people who have a negative impression of him, is quite high for a leader who has only been in the job for a few months. And you see this especially in Quebec. His numbers in Quebec are particularly bad. So I think that is one of the reasons why we haven't seen a lot of movement in voting intentions, is that... A lot of people already have their views of Justin Trudeau, and so that's not really moving things. And a lot of people have a bit of a, a ceiling on how much they're willing to give a Pierre Poilievre. And I think that's what has been holding the Conservatives back. So he has not been able to take this issue and help himself. Uh, we'll see if it'll eventually whittle away Liberal support, but the Conservatives aren't coming out better out of this story. Mm -hmm. and, and let's also talk about Jagmeet Singh here, because he, he has figured large in this debate, certainly uh, with the vote, uh, the, or the decision rather, whether or not to vote along with the Conservatives last night. How are Jagmeet Singh's numbers. Jagmeet Singh's numbers have always been better than uh, the other leaders, and Justin Trudeau inclu included in that. And his positive ratings, his approval ratings are generally positive rather than negative. We see that from the other leaders that more people tend to dislike them than like them. Uh, we haven't seen that drag up the NDP support, and that's been the case since he's become leader. Uh, the NDP has not really been able to move forward very much. We'll see if his role over the last week or so will have a positive imp impact on his numbers. I think one of the issues for Jagmeet Singh is that he doesn't get as much attention as everyone else. So it takes a lot more to move the NDP support. But so far, uh, he remains more popular than his two other rivals, but it hasn't really helped the NDP. Okay. Now, of course, the Prime Minister has appointed a special rapporteur, uh, David Johnston's recommendations. They're due uh, by the end of May, the, the recommendations on a way forward. I, I wonder, will pushing that decision down the road actually hurt the Liberals by keeping the issue alive, or could it benefit them by kicking the can down the road, as we heard from a Conservative MP describe it this week. It, it is possible that if Canadians aren't all that engaged in this issue, particularly in a partisan way, uh, that putting it off until later in the year won't have much of an impact. But this is also minority government. So the clock is always ticking on when the next election is. And if it means that a public inquiry is going to take place later rather than sooner, the timing might not work out very well. Uh, and also there will be the testimony we'll see from Katie Telford at the committees. So th there will be a lot of other things I think that are going to make almost um, Mr. Uh, Johnston's recommendation recommendations seem like a, a non-event when they come out in May. Uh, but certainly if this story can drag on in a way that people start to forget about it, that'll be better for the Liberals probably. But uh, I don't think that'll be the case. And the longer the story goes on, the closer that it will be to a next election. And that is just a wild card that the Liberals can't predict what kind of, the, what kind of impact that would have on the campaign trail. Eric, really appreciate the insight. I will speak again soon. But for now, thank you. All right. Thank you. That's Eric Renier. Well, let's turn to some other stories making headlines today as well. Once patients are finally given a diagnosis, treatments and medications are not always available. When they are, they are often unaffordable and out of financial reach, with prices ranging from $100,000 
to over $2 million per patient per year, sometimes for life. The federal government is pledging new money for Canadians dealing with the cost of rare diseases. That includes some $1.4 billion for bilateral agreements with the provinces and territories. The health minister saying better access to new and existing drugs, more early diagnosis and more screening are the top priorities. Our support for Ukrainians who are bravely defending their homes from Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine remains steadfast. Well, that was the federal immigration minister, Sean Fraser, announcing today that Ukrainians who are seeking refuge in Canada will have an additional three months to apply for emergency visas. The original deadline was March the 31st, just nine days from now. These visas would allow Ukrainian refugees to stay in the country for three additional years. And those who have received emergency visas but have yet to come will get another year to make the journey if they wish. The move welcomed by Ukrainian groups as the extension will provide greater flexibility for people who are still dealing with the uncertainty brought on by war. And immigration is fueling a record rise in Canada's population. More than a million people arrived last year, boosting our population by nearly 3% to 39,566,248 people. That is the highest growth rate since the 1950s. And if it continues, our population will double in about 26 years. StatsCan also reporting 2022 was the first time Canada welcomed more temporary immigrants than permanent. Well, let's get back to the foreign interference story. Now, as we know, David Johnston now has his mandate letter, but is that only delaying an inevitable public inquiry? Earlier this week, we spoke about that with Jean-Pierre Kingsley from 1990 to 2007. Kingsley served as Canada's chief electoral officer. Pleasure, sir. Now, in choosing uh, the route of an independent uh, rapporteur, the Prime Minister points to the Critical Election Incident Public Protocol Panel, uh, which has, as you know, concluded interference from the Chinese Communist Party did not compromise any riding results nor the outcome of an election. How much weight does that carry with you? A modicum amount, not more than that. We don't know by which criteria these judgments were arrived at, either in terms, and I don't wish to cast aspersions on the results. I'm just saying they asserted that, and we were not apprised of the events, and we were not apprised of the standards by which they arrived at those uh, those, uh, conclusions. The, The part of the issue here is that that committee is formed of, I think it's five very senior officials in the government of Canada, who all reply to the government of Canada for their activities, for their responsibilities, which they did. But the criteria they utilized, we don't know. And what happened to the reports, we're just finding out now. Mm -hmm. So what then do you make of the two investigations ordered by the Prime Minister and the appointment of David Johnston as Special Rapporteur? But in terms of the, uh, the two agencies that will be essentially looking into what they've done, that will be of some interest to me. Uh, but passing interest. I'm much more interested in the fact that there should be a public inquiry, uh, and I'm certainly hoping that uh, this will be Mr. Johnson's recommendation to the Prime Minister. Uh, As a matter of fact, in order to maintain any kind of credibility about anything in terms of our electoral process, there has to be a public inquiry. We're at that stage now. Uh, All the polling is telling us how serious this matter has become in, in terms of the perceptions of Canadians. Mm-hmm. So a public inquiry is what you believe is needed, but why, why not allow the rapporteur to, to have the time to determine whether that is actually, in fact, what should be used in this case? At, at the end of the day, he is empowered to, to make that recommendation to the Prime Minister. Well, I'm sure he'll take whatever time he thinks is required, but I still maintain that it should be a public inquiry. Uh, and I still maintain that that should have been the call right from the start and not have the special rapporteur brought into a picture here. Uh, and uh, even though I have a lot of respect for Mr. Johnson and his integrity, uh, I still maintain that the prime minister should have proceeded directly to the appointment of a, of a uh, public inquiry. Could you dig deeper as to why you believe that, though? You reference it very quickly, but why do you actually think an inquiry is needed in this case? Because the prime minister continues to make the argument maybe down the road, but not right now. 
right now because we don't know when the election, the election will take place. You see, the reason why we need to go to the bottom of this is because this occurred in the election in 2019, of which we were not apprised. The election in 2021, again, we were not apprised. And there's an election looming eventually. And the reason we need to know what happened is that so we can try to prevent it's happening again. It's not a matter of only looking to see who's to blame, what elements are uh, it, were in the hands of Canadians. Did they break any laws in doing so? That's important. But what really matters is reinstalling the trust of Canadians in the process. And that trust has to extend to the fact that we know enough now to know that we can prevent this from happening again, whether it's from China or some other entity from around the world that is not Canadian. That is the issue here. So when should Canadians, or the Canadian public rather, be alerted to election interference? How can that actually happen without interfering with the democratic process? Well, I also, I, I've already mentioned, uh, I already wrote to the government about this before the 2021 election, and I said there should be a person sitting on that committee who is independent, who is not re responsible to the prime minister, to the government, for their activities and for their reports. And that person would make a determination what it is that, that is sufficiently grave, serious, that it warrants Canadians being advised. And I'll tell you, the bar should be very low about what should be reported, because otherwise that's where you see we're living the situation now where the, there is this significant erosion of trust in our system. The best electoral system in the world, by the way, second to none, I will get, I will modify what I've just said, because of all the Canadians have done for 102 years, we've had integral integrity in our elections like no other country in the world. We were the first country in the world to establish an independent chief electoral officer. So do you see the prime minister politicizing this process by not going to a public inquiry right away, uh, perhaps even harming uh, the integrity with which Canadians look at their elections that you talk about? Well, for 17 years, I did not make any comment that was political in nature, and I don't intend to start making them right now. I don't know what the motivation is of the prime minister, and to me that is secondary in terms of whether or not we should go ahead with it right now. Jean-Pierre Kingsley, thank you so much for the time tonight. Really appreciate it. Good night. Pleasure. And of course, we'll continue to follow the story in the days ahead. Now, tomorrow, we will shift our focus to Joe Biden as he makes his first physical state visit to Canada as the U.S. president. You can join us tomorrow night for special coverage of his arrival. Until then, I'm Michael Serapio. And for everyone here at CPAC, thank you for joining us. We'll see you again.